the second Brian's going to come up and share some information with y'all. Y'all? There's always like multiple pies and I can never just eat the one pie. I have to have the sampler platter, so I feel that. All right, yes, JT's up with that. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. All right, I also am known as the, uh, the pie garbage disposal. Whatever Joey doesn't eat, I eat that as well too, so. All right, so anyways, um, my name's Brian and I'd like to welcome you guys. Um, I just have a few announcements. Uh, number one, uh, December, uh, this month we will have no service Saturday. So normally uh, the first week of every month we have a service day and that would be the second coming up, but we're not going to have that. Instead we're going to focus on the Christmas giving project and stay tuned for more info about that. It's coming this week. All right. And then uh, we do have on December 10th after the gathering, which is about two weeks from now, um, that we have a starting point. So if you want to learn more about threads and you want to learn uh, more about ways to get plugged in and uh, just kind of the history of threads, just a brief overview, it's right after the gathering on December 10th. Cool? All right, and um, we have no weekly today. We apologize. Uh, we've spent quite an eventful week here. Um, but giving envelopes and connection cards are available. Um, if you go into the, we call this the front porch. Is it called the front porch still? We have staff that. Oh, it is no longer <laughs> called the front porch. Okay, I did not get that memo. Okay. So it's that area that you come in the middle, you know, it's got white cabinets and stuff. The, the, what? the entryway, yes, the entryway. Should not be the entryway. Okay. There's a little white table that's right outside the doors to the left. It's got connection cards and giving envelopes. If um, you have decided to call for at your home and feel comfortable, uh, giving um, is a good way to, uh, to just demonstrate worship and just to, to show that your money is God's money. Just a good way to think about that. So um, I like to call it, uh, you know, just. It's, it's just a piece of worship, just like singing, just like serving, things like that. All right, so uh, let's see here. Uh, one more thing, we do have fuel next Sunday, right after the gathering, and that's for 6th through 12th graders. And if you have a musical instrument that you can play or you can just bring, that will be lots of fun. We're going to have a musical instrument jamboree happen. It'll be lots of fun. And you're going to bring your trombone, all the great. And let's see, Savannah is going to bring her uh, recorder, right? Joey, you're going to bring, where is Joey? I don't see him. Well, he's going to bring his uh, his cajon. And let's see, is Annabelle and Sydney, they're going to bring some sort of, sort of oh, they're going to bring their drum pad, I think. Yes. All right. It'll be lots of fun. All right, so uh, last but not least, we have our welcoming affirmation. And I apologize, I had it all set to go. It was in my, uh, my app, there it is, right there. Awesome, everybody stand up, and we're gonna face uh, towards each other here. If you guys could repeat after me, that would be awesome. You are loved. You are loved. You are welcome. You are welcomed. You belong. In this place and in God's family. In this place and in God's family. Awesome. Thank you. All right. And as we continue, now we're going to look at today's first word, which is out of First John chapter four, verses sixteen through nineteen. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence 
on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us.
thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you that no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter where we are, that your love always finds us. That your love is good, that your love is kind, your love is patient. We thank you that we can sing these songs about your love, about your strength, and that we can fully trust in you, knowing that you are, that you are our God, and that you are good. We thank you and we pray this in your name. Amen. You may have a seat. All right, this is the moment where any kiddos who are here who would feel comfortable to come up and chat with me you are welcome to come on forward and have a seat on the floor for a second. It's so good to see you guys this morning. How are you? Good. Good. We watched the brand new pop from you watch the Paw Patrol movie, and I see that you have a Paw Patrol shirt on. Very nice. I have a, I have a question for you guys, Can, and I'll, I'll love to talk to you about Paw Patrol after church, okay? So, what season is it, you guys? November. November, fall. That's right. Now, I heard that it's supposed to start snowing today. Did any of you hear that? Yeah, and when it starts snowing, then what season does it feel like? Winter. Then it feels like winter, right. And so, what is something we, we tend to get really excited about that comes in December? Christmas. Yes, Christmas is coming. And in fact, next Sunday is the first week of Advent. Raise your hand if you've heard of Advent before. Maybe a little bit. So Advent means like um, coming, means kind of like getting ready. So do any of you have a baby brother or sister, or do you remember having a baby brother or sister? You do, yeah. And when you, when, yeah, Adrian, that's right. And when you have a baby coming into your family, you get ready. Right? You have to get ready. What kinds of things do you do to get ready for a baby to come? You set up. That's right. Like you get a place for them to sleep. What were you going to say, sweetie? I have a sister. You have a sister? Yeah, I do. Yeah? What were you going to say? Christmas is about celebrating Jesus. It's about celebrating Jesus. That's right. And Advent is the weeks before seeing before Christmas, where we get ready for celebrating Jesus. Because on Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus came as a baby. And any baby that's coming into a family, you get ready. So in Advent, we get ready to celebrate baby Jesus coming to save the world. And so do you think, right now these decorations look kind of like fall, don't they? Do you think some things might look different up here next week? I think they might look a little Christmassy. Yeah? I was gonna ask if somebody wanted to pour the water. Obi, would you please do that? I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. So I'm excited to celebrate Advent with you guys the next few weeks. Did you get a little splash there, buddy? <laughs> a little surprise. Thank you, Obi. All right. So I'm going to pray that in the next few weeks of December, as it starts to feel like winter, and as we start to think about Christmas, that your hearts would be getting ready for celebrating baby Jesus. So let's pray. Do you want to open your hands like you're going to receive the gift of God's blessing? And I'll pray a blessing for you. I do like this, but I want to Okay, you can do that. You can do like that. Okay, you do it how you want. But let's pray. Lord God, thank you for these children and for the gift that they are. Thank you that you love them more than they can possibly know or understand. Lord, I pray that you would open their hearts to experience your love more and more, and especially as we approach the season of Advent, that their hearts would prepare a place for you and that they would 
understand your love and your goodness more deeply as they think about your willingness to come um, to be with us in the world as a little baby and as a child growing up, just like they're growing up. So we thank you for your love for them and ask for your blessing now as they go down to kids' community. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And you guys can head down with Miss Laura and Mr. Justin. All right, I'm going to pop up here. If I haven't met you before, I'm Rebecca Bell. I'm the pastor here at Threats. It's good to be with you this morning. We're going to take a few moments to engage our liturgical element, which this week is prayers of the people. And so this is just an opportunity <laughs> to bring our, uh, our praises and our requests in prayer before the Lord, both individually as a community and even lifting up um, our wider community um, and the needs of the world as well. So um, I will go ahead and pray for us this morning, but before I do that, um, I'm wondering if there are any specific prayer requests or expressions of praise and gratitude that anyone would like uh, to have included as we pray this morning. Brian? wonderful news. We prayed for him last year when he was in really um, really deep waters and waiting for a heart transplant. So that's wonderful to hear. Jamie? My aunt Pat is what on the death section of the corner. Who is? My, my aunt Pat. Your aunt Pat? Okay. She's been in water for a while. Okay. I was not sure what you guys Okay, so we'll pray for your Aunt Pat as she's nearing the end of her life. Yeah. All right, thanks for sharing that, Jamie. Susie. I'm glad that you think that God has um, supported me and Christ's goodness shining out through through God's people. Yes. Your friend had back surgery? Yes. Okay. What's your friend's name? Justine. Justine. Okay. All right, we pray for Justine. And Pat. Gratitude for John Hop. Gratitude uh, in the wake of just the care of the church family in the wake of hands. Here for their families, 
Lord, and we praise you in particular for the ways that you have demonstrated your love and your care. Lord, for, um, for Brian's friend and co-worker, John, who had a successful heart transplant and who um, is just doing so well with his new heart. We thank you for preserving his life and for the tremendous gift of a new heart. We pray your continued blessing on him and his family and on the donor uh, family as well. And Lord, we thank you for the way that your church family um, here at Threads has come around Susie with such love and kindness um, in the wake of Dan's illness and death last week. We just thank you for all the love and support that Susie's experienced, and we pray for your continued comfort for her, your presence and nearness to her. We thank you for the assurance that we have in you that Dan is with you and is free of pain and suffering. And Lord, we turn to you with requests on behalf of our, our community. Lord, we lift up Jamie's Aunt Pat to you. We ask that you would be near to her as she draws near to the end of her life. We pray that um, any pain or discomfort that she is experiencing physically would just be well um, managed, that she would receive excellent care, and that she would experience your grace and your nearness. And Lord, we um, lift up to you Audrey's friend, Justine, who has uh, recently had back surgery. We ask for um, quick and complete healing and um, recovery, that there would be no surprise bumps in the road to recovery, but that she would just be back to full uh, functioning really quickly. And Lord, um, there are other needs in this church family that are not spoken this morning, and I'm just going to pause for a moment so that we can lift those to you in the quiet of our own hearts. Lord, we pray beyond our own community. Uh, we pray for the world, Lord, this groaning and aching world as we move toward the Advent season, Lord, and we become perhaps more keenly aware of the, the groaning and darkness of the world into which your light shines. We're reminded of how desperately the world needs your presence and needs your healing. Uh, Lord, we, we think particularly of conflicts around the world. We think of Israel and Palestine, Lord, and just the heartbreaking reality of untold numbers of people killed and the out, outrageously high numbers of women and children killed in Gaza. Lord, have mercy. We ask that your people around the world would be equipped to do whatever we can to speak healing, to stand for peace, for ceasefire, for the end of bombing and war. Lord, we ask for there to be real peace. Lord God, we, we saw images yesterday of hostages being released, and God, we're so grateful. We ask that you would continue to um, continue to bring life instead of death, Lord, that, that a peace process would be able to be re-engaged. Lord God, we think of conflicts in other places in the world, in, in the Sudan, 
in the Ukraine, in Central Africa. Lord, we ask that your peace would reign, that your people would rise up and stand for peace, that your people would risk their own comfort for the sake of aiding those in distress. Lord God, so much of that feels a world away to us. And we ask that you would help us to not become desensitized to the suffering of your people around the world, and that you would help us to find ways to be your light in the darkness. And Jesus, we ask that you would come and that you would heal the world where it is broken. Thank you again that we can come to you in prayer. We ask that you would continue to meet with us here as we gather, that you would meet each heart, that you would speak the words that we need to hear. We thank you that you're present, that you're attentive to us. We ask that you would make us attentive to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I have the privilege this morning of introducing um, Jesse, who is going to preach this morning instead of me. Some of you have had the opportunity to meet Jesse Panay. She's been around here for um, on and off for the greater part of a year, I think, but here more intensively um, since the fall began. Jesse serves here as our um, ministry resident, which she is. Um, doing in a volunteer capacity right now, but Jessie has her uh, MDiv from Grand Rapids Theological Seminary, and she is a, um, a chaplain candidate in the Navy, and so she is hanging out here with us at Friends Getting Ministry Experience um, as she pursues that goal of being a Navy chaplain. And so I am extremely grateful uh, for Jesse's presence here with us at Fred's. We meet regularly. Jesse's part of the teaching team here. Um, it has been just behind the scenes a tremendous help to me over the past several months um, in a wonderful voice in teaching team. But this is her first time preaching here at Fred's, so I'm so excited for her to be able to do that. Um, so would you join me in welcoming Jesse as she um, prepares to speak to us here this morning. Can I take just a quick second to pray for you before you speak? All right. Lord, I thank you for Jesse and that she gets to share with us this morning what you put on her heart. I thank you for all the years of of investment she has made in preparing herself to, to serve in ministry, Lord, all the investment she's made in learning to be a faithful interpreter of scripture, and I pray that you would speak to her and through her this morning for the, for the building up of your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Oops, Thank you. All right, I'll just like to open up um, a prayer before we begin our message. Lord, thank you so much just for being able to come in this space with us, among the chaos of the world and everything that we've got going on in our lives. Uh, we just pray that we know your presence, that we know your name, um, and that we know that we are beloved. In your beautiful name we pray, amen. So last week, we finished up a series all about meltdowns in the Bible. And in that series, you may have identified with Moses' anger, Numbers 20, Elijah's complete despair, 1 Kings, or perhaps Paul and Barnabas' relational meltdown in Acts was much too close to relational meltdowns you experienced in your life. All these great meltdowns brought up different memories of both pain and growth as we saw how God tended to his people and met each one of them exactly where they were. In their despair, and their disobedience, and among the chaos, God reached out, healed, and restored his people. Nevertheless, it was Peter's meltdown and redemption that seemed to affect me the most. 
For whatever reason, John 21, 15 through 17, where Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to confess his love to Jesus three times and reaffirms Peter's call, has come up repeatedly in conversation after conversation. So much so that by the third week of this passage coming up for what seemed like the 50th time, I thought it might be important to finally pay attention. <laughs> So what was it about Peter's story that kept circling through the minds of the people around me? Why was his story simultaneously bringing people to tears of both joy and pain? These are the questions I've been asking from a somewhat observational, almost scientific perspective for about two months now. That was until last week. <laughs> for whatever reason, last week I found myself running from the service hiding in my car, and driving home with tears pouring down my face. For the first time, I was no longer a distant observer of Peter's shame. I was now a full-fledged participant in both his shame and, slowly, his experience of Jesus' liberating, grace-filled acceptance as beloved. And how fitting is it that we find Peter's affirmation as beloved in the Gospel of John? A book whose author consistently refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John knew his identity as beloved. And if you take nothing else away from our time together today, take this. You are beloved too. So this brings us to our passage today, um, which can be found in Luke 4, 1 through 13. This is Luke's telling of when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the Judean desert where the devil tempted Jesus. Now feel free to read along with me or just sit back and listen. So Luke 4, 4 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, One shall not live on bread alone. The devil then led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all of their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil then led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered again, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all of his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Now you might be wondering how this passage has anything to do with our identity as beloved. And you would be right to ask that. And to find the answer to that question, we're all just going to go back to Sunday school where the answer is almost always Jesus. <laughs> So let's take a look at Luke 21 and 22 in the, chapter, in the chapter just before this passage. Luke 21 and 22 read, Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. You see, Jesus is beloved in whom God is well pleased. And many scholars refer to Jesus' temptation in the desert as his preparation for ministry. And so if that is the case, then Jesus was enthroned as beloved before any word or deed proved that he was. Jesus did not obey God to earn love. Rather, love is Jesus' foundation for ministry. Because Jesus is beloved. And the good news is that the unity we have in Christ makes us beloved too. We know this from such passages that Jesus speaks, like in John 22 and 23, where it says, I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as you are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity 
that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Now this is quite the paradigm shift in a world that is constantly hurling malicious titles at us unless we can prove ourselves. These titles sometimes saturate our very being and root within us as shame. We become entrapped in a cycle of self-rejection and our shame is often so engulfs our identity that it guards the, guards the title that our loving God wants us to receive, the title of beloved. And unfortunately, when we are not aware of our belovedness, we encounter not only many of the circumstances that resemble the many guilt-filled meltdowns we have read about in the past few weeks, but we also experience shame that stems from no wrongdoing of our own, but from the injustices of the world. We begin to manifest a shame-formed identity without even realizing it. And this is what set me running from the building last week after the message. I was scared, and I didn't know why. I cried, and I didn't know why. You see, as I sat through the service last week, Knowing that I would stand here today, I envisioned what that might look like. And before I could hear the Spirit's voice say, You are my beloved in whom I am well pleased, shame rushed in to consume my identity. And even though I spent the whole week before that being encouraged and supported by many of you here at Threads, and even though I have been immersed into the stories of the Bible each week by Rebecca's beautiful preaching, shame seemed to have a final say. The voices of this world that told me that I could not possibly preach on a Sunday morning as a woman came rushing in, specific moments when I was told I was just dust to drown out the Spirit's loving declaration that I am beloved and whom God is well pleased. And this is often the way of shame particularly a shame for an identity. And I know I am not alone in this feeling. I have sat through countless stories full of shame and pain and hurt and grief that stem from the world doing a darn good job at drowning out our God-given talent title as beloved. I might even be as bold as to say that shame is our biggest adversary, not only in life, but also in scripture. It was shame that the devil was trying to tempt Jesus with in the first temptation in Luke 4.3 when he uttered, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, the construction of the Greek in this statement tells us that the devil did not doubt Jesus' title as Son of God, but we can surmise that he sure did want Jesus to. And what a better time to do it than with food in a moment when Jesus' hunger state was at an all-time high after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. Now this also harkens back to how it was by food in the Garden of Eden, though not from hunger, that mankind was first tempted. Even more so, it was shame that was the root of Eve's temptation. This is beautifully spelled out in Kurt Thompson Enzi's book, The Soul of Shame, when referring to the serpent tempting Eve with a forbidden fruit, he states the following. One way to read this is to assume that the creature, referring to the serpent, hoodwinks the woman, enticing her to take hold of what she does not have. But it strikes me as odd that she would want what the serpent is offering unless she has already developed an underlying emotional distress she needs an antidote for. If the relationships between the man, the woman, and God are unsullied, what else would she possibly desire? God has already given the couple the entire fruit of the garden to choose from. So much goodness. What else could they possibly want? I assume that before her encounter with the serpent, the woman has lived in a world of anticipated joy. She assumed that she was loved and did not need to wonder about it. In the same way, she did not need to think about breathing. That is, unless or until something comes along and directs it to shear it off. And Thompson continues. Here is where the primal emotion and location of shame, from which proceeds all that we call sin, emerges. In all sin, all idolatry, all coping strategies in which I indulge are ways for me to satiate my hunger for relationship, my longing to be known and loved, my desire to be desired. 
Here we have the subtlety that only the craftiest wisdom can muster. The woman is accused of being undesirable, not enough. And as a solution for this, the creature turns Eve's attention to the most desirable thing in the garden, which has nothing to do with relationship. Between the creature's initial question and the statement that reframes the woman's imagined reality, it is not too much to assume that shame is already working its magic long before she eats the fruit. Now, don't ask me what Adam was doing during all of this, <laughs> but we can easily assume, at least from this perspective, that shame had its deathly grip on him too. And this is often where Luke shows Jesus filling in where Adam and Eve did not, or possibly could not. Jesus was not overcome by shame because he remembered his identity as beloved. And because of this, Jesus responds to the devil's first temptation in our passage with Deuteronomy 8.3 and says, It is written, One shall not live on bread alone. You see, Deuteronomy 8 tells of a time that was at the height of Israel's need for reliance on God's provision. Where like the 40 days wilderness fast Jesus had just experienced, God remained faithful to Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, feeding them manna from heaven. So what evidence would Jesus have to doubt God's provision now? Was he not God's beloved son in whom he was well pleased? Jesus knew that he was. This was God's promise to him at his baptism. Jesus did not fall into the lies of the great adversary that wanted to tell him that God would not provide for him. He was beloved. Now this is not to say that being beloved would spare Jesus from the trials and injustices of human life. We know that Jesus suffered greatly. However, his identity as beloved strengthened him to endure. And this brings us to temptation number two. The second temptation was a simple quid pro quo. Worship me, said the devil, and all the kingdoms of the world are yours. Now Jesus could have grasped at this opportunity. He could have sought the way of kingship that avoided the trials and injustices of the cross. And admittedly, the temptation to sustain oneself and to establish kingship over the world did not seem like outright terrible things for the Son of God to achieve. In fact, it is believed that the Jewish people at the time fully expected the Messiah that would come in power and rule the world. This is what the Pharisees and Sadducees got hung up on. They did not expect a Messiah that could be tempted by the devil, much less one that turns down three opportunities to demonstrate and grasp that he's not dominant. <laughs> However, this was not God's plan. The Son of Man was sent to deny himself for the sake of others. He was to build the kingdom through self-denying love and sacrifice and obedience to the Father, not the devil. He did not seek food or power through wrongful means. In this instance, Jesus is actually choosing opposition to the power of darkness and oppression that consume our world. Jesus will be king, but he will be king within the full embodiment as beloved in whom God is well pleased. Living into his unashamed, fully beloved identity, Jesus does not use his power to tear down the devil. He once again uses a different kind of power, one found in scripture. This time, Jesus references Deuteronomy 6.13 when he says, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so it's about at this point that the devil realizes that he's got to put all his cards on the table. It's all or nothing at this point. At this point. And so he decides the best way to do this would be to match Jesus' use of scripture. After all, some of the greatest adversaries know scripture well. It is often their weapon of choice. So in the third temptation, the devil brings Jesus to the center of it all, Jerusalem. And it is at this climactic point that the devil tempts Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple and even quote scripture, saying, God will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. A stone. Essentially, the devil was saying that God should save Jesus if he were to jump. And so Jesus simply responds with an ironic, do not put the Lord your God to the test. As 
for you to know that it is also your deeds that should not be tested. And so in Jesus' humility, the pride of the devil is stifled. To jump would have been unbelief, masquerading in faith. But Jesus knew his identity well. He was beloved and had nothing to prove. And in this final temptation, we see that the devil knows the words of Scripture well, but that Jesus knows the heart of Scripture. And it is here where I'm always amazed at how the lies, words of Jesus, seem to continue to correct so much pain, hurt, and sorrow that has come from Scripture being used as a weapon of malicious intent. When others use Scripture to infuse shame into our society, Jesus uses Scripture to extinguish shame. When others tell me to calm down, you are just dust, the life, death, resurrection, and words of Jesus told me that I am so much more. When we turn our faces towards Jesus and away from shame, we are invited to participate in the heart of Scripture. Because once we shake off the shackles of shame and proudly adorn the powerful title of beloved, that is when we can share that love that we were given. Because while the title of beloved does not spare us from the trials of this world, it does give us the power that is much stronger than this world can offer. And as Michael Bishop Curry said in his royal wedding sermon, there's power in love to help and heal when nothing else can. There's power in love to lift up and liberate when nothing else will. There's power in love to show us the way to live. Set me as a seal in your heart, a seal in your arm, for love is as strong as death. So last week, Rebecca invited us to explore what our campfire was. What is the thing that causes so much shame and guilt and disappointment in yourself that even the sight or smell of something associated with that experience brings it all rushing back? This week, I invite you to explore similar moments of shame, except perhaps ones that have nothing to do with what you have done, but rather moments when the world has told you who you are. Moments when shame has choked out the voice that calls you beloved. And invite Jesus there too. Again, listen for the voice of the Spirit calling you to live fully in the new identity God has given you in Christ, as beloved in whom God is well pleased. The old certainly has gone, the new has come, you are a new creation, you are beloved. Well, let's pray. Lord, we come to you in our moments of shame and ask for your presence. Let us hear your voice when you call us beloved. Unmask the world around us, but so we are anything but precious. And guide us towards the people and places that speak your truth. We are beloved. Thank you for this shame shattering name. May it lead us toward the love that involves the world. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to transition to a time of communion. And so when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He was not referring to the hunger and thirst that pervades this world. Rather, Jesus knew that one shall not live on bread alone. We are also continually nourished and guided by the Spirit through Christ. This bread represents the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given to unite us as beloved in Christ. This juice represents Christ's blood poured out for us. Take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed to unite us as beloved in Christ. So all are welcome for taking communion here. Um, as you come up, you can grab a piece of bread, dip it in the juice, um, and there's also a gluten-free option in the smaller container as well.
Beloved, beloved, beloved. Amen. 